That's okay. That's okay. No, there was a little confusion. I'm, I apologize for being late. I uh, tried to do too many things at one time, and you know, I was trying to get some supper for my friends who who uh, graciously came out and was uh, here to support me and listen to me. So I appreciate that. And, uh, this evening, I'm going to be talking mostly about meaning, and not to be redundant, but what it means to have meaning. Um, and we're also, I'm going to touch upon some other things like order, um, and some of our shared values that we that we have as individuals, uh, whether you're inside or outside the church. Um, there are certain things that we all look for and strive for. Uh, and we see these, whether you look at the Bible or you look at other stories or epics of other cultures, these, for another word, archetypes um, or overarching values that we attribute to people, our heroes, um, those we look up to, uh, not necessarily the heroes of comics and things like that, but if you think of even outside of the scriptures, Hercules, or um, there's Siegfried uh, in the gods is another one from Greek culture, if you're familiar with it. Uh, but there are, there are other cultures who have focused on these type of traits that don't necessarily believe in one god but they still strive for these things. So there, there's a common bond there, and the reason for that common bond is one of the things that I'm gonna try and touch upon in my sermon. So to begin, uh, there are deep biological shared values which we all have, and to ignore them can lead to great, uh, grave unhappiness on every level. A true sense of meaning is revealed and is outside of who we really are. It is beyond that which we can touch, taste, hear, and smell. Now this is known as transcendent, or outside of the realm of those, those uh, senses, in, it, in its very nature. The true sense of meaning, a true sense of meaning, will quiet the soul. And if that meaning you've, you've found does not then maybe you're looking in the wrong place. Meaning cannot be found without first adhering to order. Now, what I mean by order, and sometimes that can be, especially for someone like me, um, I, I get a little nervous when I hear the word order because I'm not, an, an, uh, I'm not always an organized person, it, you can't tell. Uh, but there are certain times where order is necessary and in certain things where order is needed in order to function properly and to, if you will, to, to move on with life in a way that makes it happy. Uh, so just to define order, it's a state of being where the people around you act in accordance to well understood and well established social norms and remain predictable and cooperative. Now, I will say that order does not mean that you give up your individual self or your autonomy, your ability to make decisions on your own and to choose or not to choose to do things. So we're not talking about a dictatorship necessarily, um, but we are talking about an order where people have shared values and they cooperate with one another. Um, now, these, these things are sometimes, Lewis, excuse me, let me go back to this, Lewis, C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Four Types of Love, talks about meaning and its relation to nature. Because sometimes I hear people uh, bring up the idea of nature and how it talks about God. And he puts that into a perspective when he writes, uh, nature never taught me there existed a God of glory and infinite majesty. I had to learn that in other ways. But nature gave the word glory a meaning for me. I do not see how the fear of God could have had ever meant anything 
but the lowest form of effort to be safe if I had never seen certain ominous ravines and unapproachable crags. Crags, excuse me. And if nature had never awakened a certain longing in me, huge areas of what I now mean by the love of God would never, so far as I can see, have existed. Now he goes on to say, of course, the fact that a Christian can so use nature is not even the beginning of the proof that Christianity is true. Those suffering from dark gods, or a, a, he uses that term in quotes, it's not a literal but more of a metaphoric uh, point, uh, can equally use her, meaning nature I suppose, for their creed. That is precisely the point. Nature does not teach. A true philosophy may sometimes validate an experience in nature, but an experience in nature cannot validate a philosophy in specific terms of Christianity. Later he states, uh, the, the created glory may be exper uh, expected to give us hints. Sorry. I'm sorry, they're out of order. Oh, okay, sorry. May give us hints of the uncreated, for the one is derived from the other, and in some fashion reflects it. I've heard in other places, there are other um, places where I've said, the mind of God, or the mind of man reflects the mind of God. In the idea that we are conscious of things, we understand and know good and evil. And we, we know this from uh, the story of Adam and Eve, which we're going to get into in a moment. But... I want to bring us to a passage of scripture. Uh, if you will turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 through 48. Paul is talking about the resurrection of the dead and how those who are going to be resurrected and the difference between the spiritual body and the natural body, or the body in nature. He starts in verse 42 by saying, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, and it is raised a spiritual one. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of dust of the earth, and the second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so... Thank you. Uh... So also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have bore the image of earthly man, so shall we bear the image of a heavenly, of a heavenly man of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of an earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Sorry, must have, I must have had that there twice. My apologies. I declare, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit, inherit that which is imperishable. So we see that Paul points out that there is there's a definite, and we understand that, that there's a definite distinction between the natural body, that which was created, and the spiritual body, that's which will be when the creation is done, is the, when the lifespan of the creation is done. Uh, so from that we can understand that if we're heading towards a spiritual body which will be their second the earthly body is not the goal so meaning is not found in just the earthly body there's something more to it there's something deeper that's there 
So to begin to understand meaning, I want to read from 1 Timothy 6 and 7, and 7 through 10. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptations and into the trap and into foolish and harmful desires that plague people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now we must understand the love of money. The, the idea, um, and Paul points this out in other places where the, uh, the people that he was writing to were waiting for the coming of the Lord, so they were selling all their possessions and not really doing anything of, uh, of any production because they were waiting for the Lord. So they, they were saying, we're just going to get ready now, and he's going to come soon. Um, what Paul is talking about is the love of money is the root of all evil. We are to be good stewards of the, the talents and the things that we have been given. Like for example, Dan. Dan has been given the, the talent of being able to be an effective and wise preacher. So he uses that talent. He gets monetary gain for it, and there's nothing wrong with that. Because that's not a love of money. That's just, you know, in later scriptures that Paul talks about, you know, uh, we're to give the due to those who preach. We're, um, that's not, that's paraphrased, not, not a verbatim. But we're to give them monetary value so that they can live while they're doing this good work. So th there's nothing wrong with that, but it's the root of evil. Uh, the, the root of evil is, is money. The root of all evil, excuse me. The love of money is the root of all evil. There we go. Um, so meaning is not found in monetary gain. It's, it's not where we start with this. Now, if you would read with me, if you turn with me to um, Proverbs chapter 1. Here we have David beginning the proverb. And this is unofficially what I call David's mission statement. He, he's writing these first few verses as an introduction saying this is what the Proverbs that he's going to write are going to do. This is, this is the benefit of them if the person who reads them listens to them and applies them to their lives. And he begins in Proverb 1 saying, For, the, for gaining wisdom and in, in, in instruction, for understanding the words of insight, for receiving, excuse me, instruction in prudent, prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young, let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance, for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, is the beginning. When David says fear, I want to put this into a little bit of perspective. Yes, God is an all powerful, all knowing, all present. I might have missed one, but he's 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 all in all. He he has all the attributes necessary to be God. Um but our fear with God is not based on God. It's based who we are in relation to God. Because I've had people ask me, why would I fear a loving, merciful, forgiving God? Whatever I do, He's going to be merciful, love, and forgive me, so why should I ever fear Him? Well, and, and, and again, my answer is, it shouldn't be for the reason, it my, shouldn't be for that reason. But because if you are not striving to do good, you are in danger, not necessarily absolute, but you are in danger of eternal punishment. So David is saying to fear God, but not because he is God, not only because he is God, uh, because of who we are in relation to God, which is a fallen people. We fear God because we are a fallen people, because we don't keep the law that God has laid down for us perfectly. And God knows that. That's why he's given us the avenue 
of redemption, confession, baptism, uh, repentance, prayer, and, and he's even taught us through Jesus how to pray. God has given us all the tools that we need, but it's just a matter of us using them properly. And he's laid down for us the archetype of what it is to be a good, solid human being who's striving to be like God. Now, there's also another famous saying that I do hear a lot, and it says, know thyself. Okay, this is not biblical in nature, but it is philosophical. Uh, there is more than, than we sometimes give it credit for. But to know oneself beyond our own preferences is to begin to awaken to the true meaning of what it is to, to, uh, for this life. The gateway to wisdom and understanding is through the development of knowing who we are and what we are capable of. That means both good and evil. And as David was pointing out in the, Pro, uh, in the Proverbs, the beginning of all knowledge and all wisdom and understanding is to fear God and keep his commandments. And why should we fear God? We should fear God because we are a fallen people. And we are inadequate for what God created us for because of our fallen nature. But through God's will, through that which he has laid us down with, laid the, the type of behaviors that he has laid us down for us and the type of things that we are to pick up, um, the fruits of the Spirit are a good example of that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, gentleness. I think I got all of them. Uh, I didn't write that one down. Through those, we transcend the law. Because it is the law. I'm sorry, we don't transcend the law. We, we complete the law because it is the law. And so, through us doing that, we have to understand our nature. We have to understand who we are, both the good and the bad. Both what we are capable of in an evil sense and in a good sense. Both things must be understood. And as we grow and mature as people in age, and especially in the church, we begin to understand that. And it's, it's a painful struggle. It requires suffering. And God doesn't promise us always to be happy. But we can be if we suffer through the things that we know that we have done wrong and we're honest with ourselves, both in good and bad. And we will get into, I will get into the story of um, or the, the parable that Jesus tells about the man with the speck in his eye and the other one with the, with the beam in his eye. We're going to get to that. Um, but I first want to go into the idea that God is, I've, I've said, God has laid down these things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. He's laid down this law for us. He has given us this law now. In the beginning, it was really simple. And we're going to kind of dive into that right now. And in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, God gives an order. Now, he's already created the world. He's created all things. He has set down for man a place but for himself and for man in Eden. He has created man and woman. He has given them this, the, the breath of life. And they are dwelling in Eden. And beginning in verse, uh, excuse me, beginning in verse 16, not 15. The Lord gave the man this order. You are free to eat from any of the trees of the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For that tree you shall not eat, and when you eat of it, you shall die. Now, I'm going to take a perspective for a moment. The tree itself, insofar as I can tell, had no other importance except that which God created it with. God created these two trees, and he said, this is for this purpose, that is for that purpose. And we know as God the creator, he can do that. If he says that's for that purpose and this is for this purpose, then it just is. Um, there is a word to describe when something is given value from its maker, such as our money today. Our money 
the paper that it's printed on has no value unless there's something to back it. Well, the same thing. These trees in and of themselves are just trees. But God gave them what's called an intrinsic value, a value given from the maker. And with that intrinsic value comes the idea of what we should and should not do. So he, he gave man a test. He said, you can eat of anything that you want, including the tree of, of life. Because he, he said, of anything, except the, knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we know both trees were in there because of the text in Genesis chapter 2. Oh, sorry, I was getting ahead of myself. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, excuse me. He said, don't touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the others, he said, he can be free to eat of. And he also meant the tree of life. I found, I, when, when I was doing my research, I, found, I, I, I have Homer Haley's handbook to the Bible. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the name. Um, he, I believe he was a member of the church. And he, um, he wrote a handbook for it. And in, in this particular uh, in this particular point that he was making, I thought it, would, it really en encompassed what, I, what the Bible is talking about and also what I'm talking about. And he writes, The essence of Adam and Eve's sin is, in part at least, oh, uh, in part at least, was this, transference of control of their lives from God to themselves. God had, in substance, told them they could do anything, or eat of anything, they wanted to accept that one thing. It was a test of their obedience. As long as they refrained, God was their master. When in spite of God's command, they did, they did that one thing, they made themselves their own master. And he, he ends it with, is this not the essence of human sin? And it's true, it is. It is, it is not... Now, this does not mean a full submission of our autonomy. Meaning, you know, the, the ability to make decisions on our own and to do and say things. Because, um, or in other, other, I've heard it also used as a free moral agent. I do, I've heard that in the church a few times. Uh, because a believer may subordinate his or her judgment to God's when there is evidence that God has given a judgment. And here he, he simply has. You can eat of anything except for that. So he doesn't say what specific trees they can eat of. He just says anything. So you can either try, you can, you can eat of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil on Tuesday. And you can eat of whatever, the banana tree on Wednesday. It, it doesn't matter. Or you can interchange them. It, it, so Adam had that. He had the autonomy, the ability, the free moral agency to do those things. But he also had the free moral agency to sin. And so did Eve. And we see that happening in the text because God didn't, you know, he just pulled them back. He's like, no, you can't do this. He, he allowed them the opportunity to. And unfortunately for all of us, they did. Uh, excuse me for a moment. Laws that we have whether of God or of man, have their root in God's law. If you ever want to know if a law is good in measure, I think it is good to measure it by this passage in Romans. Now this is Paul talking to the, the Christians in Rome, and he's instructing them on Christian godly behavior. And he begins in verse 5 by saying, Therefore, it is necessary to be subject, not only because of, of wrath, but also because of conscience. That's a word that we're going to come back to in a moment. This is why you also pay taxes for whom, for the authorities are ministers of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Pay to all their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, tolls to whom tolls are due, respect to whom respect is due, and honor to whom honor is due. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in this saying, 
namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no evil to the neighbor, hence love is the fulfillment of the law. So if we had to pick one of the traits that are the most, the, the, the most that we need to do, the most often used one, the one that would be like that beat up book on the shelf that you've read 10 million times, or you know, if you're a video game player, the, the video game that you play consistently, uh, or anything like that, the one thing that you've used more than anything else in your life, it would be love. But the great thing about it is it doesn't wear out, or it shouldn't. Good love, real love, doesn't wear out. Um, so, we see, so laws have value as, as long as they reflect the law's and maintain order, which is where the people around you, act, of course I said, if people act, act according to an establishment and establish social norms and remain cooperative. And they can do this most especially through love. But in order to do that, and it, we have to go towards that which establishes love, which is God. And this is because laws that follow a law of God have an underlying ethic behind them, which gives them meaning, and again, I used the word earlier, intrinsic value. If a law, which would be man-made in this sense is what I'm about to say, if a man-made law did not follow an ethic of God, it has no intrinsic value. And most likely, it would be very easy to acknowledge if you're a Christian that it's against a, a statute of God. Those type of laws we have to be careful adhering to. Now Paul lays out taxes, you gotta pay taxes. I realize that taxes sometimes go, and I don't like it either, taxes sometimes go to the things that we disagree with. Sometimes they go to fund abortions. Maybe not everybody in the audience disagrees with that, but a Christian should. Um, I understand there's, there's a whole other discussion and a whole other sermon that could be given about some extreme cases, and I understand that. But what I'm saying is the, the, the killing of a child is wrong in my perspective. And it's, it's a hard conversation to have, and it's sometimes one that, you know, has some, has some extreme exceptions, which probably are less than 1% of the time. Um, but they do happen. But what I'm saying is we still have to pay taxes. I'm in no way saying that we should usurp the law of, of the government in any way. We, we have to do these things. If there are things that we can see that are directly contrary to God's rule then yeah, we should be wary of those. I mean, we see that with Daniel and, and the, the credence the, that was given to him to, to not pray to any other god except for, one god, except for the god of, of that time. He said, I'm not doing it. We see it with the apostles and they're told to not preach about Jesus Christ. And they said, whether it's right for you is, you know, that's, that's up to you. But for us, we're going we're gonna to go preach the gospel. We're going to do it in spite of what you say. So, we see examples of that, and those are the type of things that I'm talking about. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's surely uh, the most prominent ones. Now, and I also want to point out that this point does not cover the idea of defending oneself in a conflict or giving of oneself to the point, of, uh, the point that is harmful. Now, these points are a whole different matter because there are times in extreme situations where we have to do things otherwise would be condoned in our society and by God, but in the times of self-defense, uh, I, I personally think there's some allotment there to defend yourself. But again, that's a whole other sermon, and I just wanted to say that that's, that's something that, that came to mind when I was writing this, so I just wanted to point that out. Now, my, my next point is, um, I'm gonna go back to Adam and Eve after the fall, they realized they were naked, vulnerable, and, and mort mortal. With one act of mankind, well, I'm sorry, with one act, mankind is thrust into the realm of suffering. 
The reason for this is because where there is a limitation, there is suffering. Before the fall, Adam and Eve didn't know they were naked. They didn't, they, and essentially, they, they, they could live forever. And there was no guilt inside of them for anything that had been done or that they could do until they ate of the knowledge of good and evil. So that's when suffering began. Because now we know that we're limited. Now we know that we're mortal. Now we know that we can die. And now we know that we can be harmed. But we also know, or we begin to know throughout these ages, how to harm another. Which is another form of suffering because God tells us not to do that. And sometimes we want to. If everyone is honest with ourselves, at some point in our lives, we've wanted to harm another because of something they've done to us. Or something they've done to someone we love. And refraining from that is a form of suffering. And I heard a question posed to me once about God and suffering, and it went like this. Follow me to the end with this. What does an all-knowing, all-seeing, all-present, all-powerful God lack? Limitation. It's not a punchline. It's a revelation. God doesn't have limitations. But he can impose limitations on himself if he so chooses. And we see that with Jesus when he was in the flesh. He limited himself, even being God, a few times in scriptures. Most notably was testing in the desert when the devil told him, make these rocks into bread. Cast yourself off of here. You know, you're the son of God. You can do these things and you can save yourself. You can do all of these things if you want to. But he limited himself and said, no, it is written. And he went back to the scriptures. Knowing the time of the end of the world, he was asked. And he said, only the father knows. Well, we know Jesus is God. And we understand the distinction between God the father and God the son, but they are one. But he limited himself because, you know, he, that, that's not something that he was going to uh, give out. And at the cross. The biggest one is at the cross. Jesus suffered on a cross. He was beaten, scourged, mocked, spit on. But he did nothing, although he could have done anything he wanted, to stop it. Which is the, I, I think, is a, is a huge form of suffering, if not the ultimate form of suffering. Having the ability to do anything and not doing it when it is most important to you. When Adam and Eve, I'm going to go back to Adam and Eve now. When, when they realized that their own mortality and limitations and suffering had begun, the suffering not only made them aware of how they could harm, again, but how they can harm one another. And we see this not long after, and it plays out in Genesis chapter 4. Now, this is a famous story, and I'm sure a lot of people understand it, the story of Cain and Abel. We see the first instance of murder in the story of Cain and Abel. Would it have happened in the garden before the fall of man? No. Because mortality wasn't even known. Because it, it didn't need to be known. The idea that you're going to die, well, it, it was under, let me take that back. In a form, it was understood. God did say, in the day that you eat of this, you shall surely die. So they understood what, at least in part, what death was. But, of course, God was talking about a spiritual death, a separation from him, not a physical death. And that's where the devil got them. He said, you're not going to die, but you're going to become like God. And it was a half-truth and, in essence, a whole lie. But as time goes on, we, we, they learned how to harm one another. And in the beginning, uh, in verse 1 of, chapter of uh, Genesis chapter 4, the man had intercourse with Eve, his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, saying, I have produced a male child with the help of the Lord. Next she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Abel became a herder of the flocks and came a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruits of the ground, while Abel brought from his part 
brought the fatted portion of the first firstlings of the flock. Excuse me. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and dejected. Anger and dejection over the limitation of not doing that which you should do. That's universal. That's anybody. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why are you dejected? For you act rightly. If you, I'm sorry, if you act rightly, you will be accepted. But if not, sin lies in wait at the door. It urges for you, you yet you can rule over it. So here's God, God, the creator of all things, giving an individual a pep talk. Hey, that sin's crouching at the door, but you can go over it. You can get over it. How many of us at some time would need that? With some sort of suffering for whatever it may be. Just God coming down with like, you can get over this. You can do it. I guess it would have different significance for us today than it would for Cain and Abel, who, I mean, obviously still in some way talk to God. So Cain said, in verse 8, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. When they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord asked Cain, where's your brother Abel? It's not the first lie, but the first, it's from what we can tell, human. No, no, not even the first human lie. There was Adam and Eve. Um, one, of the, one of the line of first lies is, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? God said to them, what have you done? Said to him, excuse me. So he kills his brother. He learns how to harm. He does so because he understands limitations of himself and of another. Because murder was not, not something that was going on before that. We have no instance of it in, in the Garden of Eden especially. So as far as we can tell, this is the first time that another, one person has killed another person. Because they understood that one, they were limited, and two, how they could be harmed and how to harm another. And each of us experience, I'm sorry, uh, each of us have experienced the limitations and the awareness of our own mortality, like our ancestors, like Cain and Abel, like Adam and Eve, and everyone since then. And in some such times, we, if we are truly honest with ourselves, see the potential for us to do what is evil. We can never not believe that we are not capable of sin even sin of the gravest type. It may take a lot. It may take a long time. But the devil can wear on you and he can make you do some very, very bad things if you are not in the word of God, if you're not trying to walk with God, and if you think that you're just fine. So I come to church every Sunday twice and Wednesday, I'm good. The devil can't touch me. And we might not say that, but there may be some sort of feeling like that. And we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to understand that we are always a moment away from sinning. We have to be vigilant. And sometimes we are, and we slip up, and that's why God has given us the avenue of mercy and of repentance and of forgiveness. But we have to ask for it. We also always have to be careful And I, I want to also go to, because um, this thought passed my, crossed my mind whenever I was writing this. Uh, it is true, as a baptized believer, the words that are written in 1 John 4 and verse 4. You belong to God, children, and you, do, and you have conquered them for, uh, he's, he's talking about the Antichrist and those who are opposed against the, um, the people. And he says, uh, you have conquered them, for the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. This applies uh, to us, so long as we resist the temptations talked about. Sorry, uh, that we apply so long as we talked about uh, the, the temptations talked about. James, 
begins by talking about the Antichrist, and he leads into the temptations of the world in James 1.14. Um, and he talks about the temptation that we, even Christians, can, can get into. And he, he says in James 1 and 14, Rather, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The desire conceived and, is brought, and brings forth sin. And when sin reaches maturity, it gives birth to death. Now, depending on the gravity of our sin, which we know that all sin is equal, but I mean, in sort of a, um, a man way of looking at it, the death may be spiritual, and in the gravest times, may be physical. So we have to be careful not to lead ourselves into those things. And one good way of doing that is to, to be a Christian and to come to church and to adhere to the archetypes that God leads us to, into. Now, this doesn't mean that we are to sacrifice... Excuse me. Uh, I think the, the, the concept of self-evaluation and the limits by which we are to judge each other are no better stated. And, of course, we're talking about... Um, we have to remember that we're also, even in our best day, one moment away from sinning. And so we have to remember that also when we're talking to others who we care about and who we're trying to lead to God. And I think this is no better stated than in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. And Jesus says in those verses, I'm sorry for the sake of time, I'm just going to read them. Um, Stop judging, that you may not be judged. For as you judge so will you be judged. And in the measure in which you will be measured out to you, why do you notice a splinter in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove the splinter from your eye, while the wooden beam is still in, is still in your eye? You hypocrite, remove the wooden beam from your eye first, and then you will see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. Now, this is not saying that we sacrifice order for non-judgmental behavior. But we be diligent in self-evaluation when we're talking to someone else that is caught up in a sin that we know of. We have to remember that we are sinners. We may never have done that which we are talking to another about, but we have to also remember that sin is sin. So in that sense, we have to make sure that we are diligent with how we present. Because Jesus says up here, in the, in the way in which you measure it, it will be measured to you. So if you measure it in mercy, in love, and in a caring attitude, then he's saying it will be measured to you. And he's talking about judgment day. Or in the way in which you are, and sometimes it may be uh, something on earth too. But he's definitely talking about in judgment. He's saying, if, if you are harsh with the judgment that you give others, it will be given to you in the same manner. We don't want that. So God is telling you, don't do that to another. He's not saying, don't judge at all, let people do whatever they want, and everything's okay. But he is saying, be careful how you judge, and be careful what you say, because it will be measured to you in the same way. And of course, this, that can be curtailed with forgiveness and repentance and a turning away from these things. But we have to be careful of that. Because we don't know when Jesus is coming back either. And I, it's, it's a final point uh, before I, 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 I move on to the, the final points that I have. Uh, for those not in the body of Christ, and there are, and I don't, I don't believe there's any here, but I do want to state this just for the record. And anyone who may be listening, for those in, not in the body of Christ, you will not escape judgment. You can say, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in what you teach. I don't believe in what the Bible teaches, so I'm good. Because if I don't believe it, it doesn't apply to me. That's wrong. Because God created everything. And so everything that God created will come under the judgment of that which made it. Meaning God. 
We cannot escape by mere disbelief. It, it doesn't happen that way. Because we all have intrinsic value given to us by our maker at the beginning of our lives. God has said, you are my creation. I have created you. So he reserves the right as the creator to judge us by the statutes and limitations and things that he has laid down. And so we, as those who understand that, and even those who don't want to understand that, are still adherent to those things in the end. Because these values, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, we all want these things. Some may have different ways of going about them and some ways are not right. But we all want them. And the better we understand them, the better we'll understand that these, these go across time. People of all races, of all religions, and of all types have tried to strive for these things. They've wrote characters who, who are epitomes of this thing. That's why Jesus is called the, well, it's not, it's not the only reason, but it's a reason Jesus is called the King of Kings is because he envelops all of these traits. All of them. So anyone that we would choose to be a leader, a king, a, a you know, anything like that, we would attribute these things to a hero, an archetype of a hero, something that's not obtainable, but that we would want to be. These are all things that we strive for. It is not something that is independent or outside of who we are. So, just to put it in perspective, God, through his word, in John 1 and 1 through 3, created everything that is. The first word gave order from nothing. And he gave consciousness and awareness to something that did not possess it. An inanimate object. An object with no animus. They, they can't move, can't function, can't think, can't talk. He gave life. He gave a consciousness. So I want to equate the consciousness with the spirit, which is of God. Because consciousness in human behavior is something that psychologists and psychiatrists don't really understand can't really quantify and there's a reason for that and I believe it's because it is the Spirit of God that is breathed into us and Adam and Eve he gave us the ability to understand ourselves to communicate to others and to identify everything this is possible through the first words now some of the other words that were spoken by a, a being this and for the sake of the comparison please follow me on this um, the second type of word was nothing like the first type we know what we're talking about. we're talking about the snake in the garden we're talking about the devil it brought corruption of perfection it brought the rise to all types of sin it sowed doubt and it gave us the consciousness of all types of chaotic things that are in our world today the first type of word became flesh, John 1 and 14, and gave us the fulfillment of the law both in action and in purpose, or the underlying ethic, love, as we talked about. Bringing a liberty to the law through the fulfillment and a new form of it through his death and resurrection. He opened it up to everyone. So it was no longer just the Israelites, it was everybody. Through the love of God, through the sacrifice, which is another form of love, of one man. So, as the conscience of the world, which is God, God is what gives everything life. Created everything, and it was good. When we use our words, as God did in the beginning, extracting or pulling out, the proper word of being, so love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-respect, words of affirmation, of affirming others in their beliefs uh, when they are good, in their attributes uh, when they are good. If we do that, then we are creating a world of right behavior and order from the potential that we have, and this is good. 
the act of extracting good from chaos meaning means behaving as the scriptures tell us in the chaos that is around us we choose order we choose goodness which is God so then the truth which we strive for is the same that is extracted out of good oh extracted I'm sorry so the truth that we strive for is the same that extracted good out of nothing at the beginning of time that is the most powerful type of good you can do this means that we are active free moral agents free to choose uh, and to confront the potential to do good or to do evil in our lives and choosing to create that which is good giving way to order and not to that which is evil which gives away to chaos and if we treat ourselves that way we have proper respect and fear for ourselves as sinners and for God as our judge because we make bad decisions and orientate because if we make bad decisions and orientate others or ourselves towards chaos behaving like the snake in Genesis chapter 1 deceiving giving half truths and and we know and we all know how that worked out for him so it's not really a good idea we should let Jesus be your your archetype for morality he fits all the qualities we look for in the people we most want and trust and deep down want to be the cross is a symbol of suffering and transformation we talked about that earlier with, with the limitations that Jesus posed on himself but he, he suffered it both physically and mentally because the son of the God and as the word of God he could have done anything to take himself down Jesus gave us the most perfect way to extract order in our lives out of the chaos and the mess of sin that it was made at the beginning of time. As this all starts with submission to God's will, you do not lose yourself the moment you are baptized, but you transform yourself and begin to be orientated uh, with God and his truth so as the men at Pentecost exclaimed to the 12 disciples in Acts chapter 2 and beginning in verse 7 now when they heard this which is Peter's speech that he gave at that time they were cut to the heart and they asked Peter and the Apostles what are we to do my brothers Peter said to them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is made to you and your children and to all those who are far off whomever the Lord will call save yourselves from this corrupt generation corruption equals chaos God equals order those who will accept that calling and other callings that have been given to the Ethiopian eunuch and to um, Cornelius in his house even after they accepted the Holy Spirit they were told to go and be baptized for the remission of their sins this is a statute that goes through the book of Acts it is something that God has laid down as an important part of what it is to obey him it is not an act it is a it is an idea of submission to God. We don't lose the autonomy of who we are. We don't become a robot in some wheel or cog. But we transform ourselves into that which is supposed to be in this world since the beginning of time. Which is goodness and order and love. That's what we do when we become a Christian. And then from there, we learn how to better do that every day of our lives. Or we should. So I want to call anyone who is subject to that to understand that God, no matter your situation, is calling you and asking you to be his. Because through him, you can live a life that may not always be peaceful. There will be suffering, but will be better than suffering without him. So if you are subject to the invitation... 
or if you have sin upon you and have lived outside the, the statutes of the Lord, please come forward and we will uh, talk with you and, and or baptize you now as we stand and sing.